Good morning. The Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee will now come to order. Today's hearing is the second day of hearings to examine the way that common equity shareholder rights acquired by the Treasury Department under authorities provided in the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008 have been exercised to date and to assess alternative frameworks for exercising and protecting taxpayers' interests. Without objection, the Chair and Ranking Minority Member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. AIG, Citigroup, GM, and Chrysler came on their knees to the government for a bailout. To an important degree, the failures of all four companies have resulted from failures in corporate governance, failures in risk management, failures in compliance, failures to hold executives accountable, and failures to rein in excessive corporate pay. Taxpayers are underwriting the rescue efforts, and the Treasury Department is managing about $200 billion in common equity in these four failing companies acquired under the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. The first question we have to ask is, is Treasury appropriately accountable to Congress and the taxpaying public in its exercise of these shares, including key decisions that Treasury has made or will have to make, such as the decision to manage the shares passively, the decision to allow Citigroup to decide when the government would divest its shares, the criteria for disinvesting, how and under what circumstances would congressional approval be required for actions such as divestiture, the regulations by which Treasury would administer the shares. The second question is, have the actions of the federal government had the effect of upholding best practices in corporate governance? Or has Treasury managed our stake in these four companies in a way that amounts to a major step backward in corporate governance? The experts we spoke with yesterday were unanimous on at least one point. The U.S. government has done far less than it could have done and should have done to advance the cause of effective, accountable corporate governance. Instead, the U.S. government has adopted a passive role by refusing to exercise even the minimal role expected of large shareholders in board-level decision-making and dealing with corporate management. This failure puts taxpayer interests and the public interest at risk in several ways. It breaks the chain of authority, transparency, and accountability. It weakens oversight functions and fosters a culture of backroom deals. And it sends a signal to corporate boards and managements that this government has very low expectations when it comes to reasonable and responsible exercise of legitimate shareholder preferences. We also heard evidence that the government hasn't taken a hands-off approach in all matters. We heard testimony in the, pa uh, in the past and received confirmation from the GAO yesterday, for example, that in the case of AIG, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York participates in board and committee meetings meets frequently with management, has a large team of experts following many aspects of company activity. The third question we have to ask is, whose interests and whose values are being represented by the way in which government shareholdings are being exercised? Nothing the Treasury Department is doing as dominant shareholder, according to our expert witnesses yesterday, assures that government-owned companies do not participate in consumer rip-off schemes, are neutral, towards any efforts by workers to unionize as the law allows them to do, or adopt stricter, stricter than legally required controls over the use of exotic financial instruments and off-balance sheet financial transactions. Fourthly, we ask, how has the Treasury used its rights as dominant shareholder to pre preserve jobs, home ownership, pensions, and life savings as the law requires? The applicable statute is the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008 which sets out two fundamental purposes. One, of course, is to provide authority and, fa and, fa and facilities that the Treasury Secretary can use, quote, to restore liquidity and stability to the financial system. 
The other, equally and important and binding, is, and I'm quoting here, to ensure that such authority and facilities are used in a manner that A, protects home values, college funds, retirement accounts, and life savings, B, preserves home ownership and promotes jobs and economic growth, C, maximizes overall returns to the taxpayers of the United States, and D, provides public accountability for the exercise of such authority. Is Treasury realizing those goals through its dominant equity positions in AIG, Citigroup, GM, and Chrysler? On jobs, we learned that our ownership, on an issue of jobs, we learned that our ownership of GM and Chrysler has actually accelerated job losses, plant closings, and dealerships. We've also downsized expectations, as well as the probability of meaningful success in protecting, let alone expanding, our core industrial base. For only the second time since records have been kept, industrial capacity is actually shrinking in this country. We were reminded that the Obama administration bragged that they were even tougher on workers' compensation than the Bush administration was, forcing American workers to accept by the end of the year paying benefits cuts to make their compensation comparable to foreign automakers in the U.S. It was pointed out that then-CEO of GM announced in October 2009, post-taxpayer bailout, that the company would be sourcing even more parts and equipment from Korea thus depriving American manufacturers of the benefits of supplying their own home market. On pensions, we're reminded that creditors of the auto companies were forced to accept as little as 10 cents on the dollar for their investments in the auto companies, while big banks that were main creditors of AIG and other companies have been made whole, made whole through this crisis. On home ownership, uh, this committee has held several hearings in Washington and in the field in Atlanta and Cleveland. It's very clear that despite whatever Treasury thinks it's doing and may well be doing, it's very hard to find anyone who's benefiting from its piecemeal meal and half-baked approach. Forget about subprime mortgages. The evidence is that the level of household indebtedness that has resulted from the government-sponsored inflation of home equity values, the extraordinary explosion of household indebtedness, between the year 2001 and 2007 is the single largest impediment to economic recovery that we face today. And nothing meaningful to most ordinary Americans has been done. And fifth, we have to ask, why is Treasury giving preferential treatment to the two financial service companies whose failures required a, bank, uh, a government bailout as compared to the treatment of two manufacturing companies? Almost every day brings new reports of yet another secret backroom negotiation to provide yet another sweetheart deal to yet another favorite and free-spending fat cat Wall Street firm. Yesterday, the revelation was the outrageous report that in order to let Citigroup escape from U.S. ownership, the U.S. Treasury, our trusted fiduciary, secretly gave its okay to an IRS exemption from a tax roll that may be worth several billion dollars. High-level administration official was quoted in the Washington Post as saying, the tax benefit was unavoidable, quote, either the government changed the rules and parted ways with Citigroup or the company kept the government as a shareholder and kept the tax break anyway. Are you kidding me? We give away the tax break, give away any semblance of control over a company that has a 30 -year, been a 30-year poster child for trouble management, had almost a continuous need for government tutelage, give away any real upside from our most massive investment in Citigroup, do this or else we'll be forced to do what? Keep our tax break? Keep our ownership? Keep our potential upside? It's a farce. It's an outrage. This committee is not going to rest until we examine uh, this last deal threadbare until we have spoken to every individual associated with it, examined every communication related to it, with every person who may have had an interest in it, or who may have had uh, some kind of a channel of influence. And I speak as someone who opposed the bailouts, who was skeptical, about this whole process from the beginning. It might be the Christmas season, but you're looking at a chairman who didn't fall off a Christmas tree. I yield to my colleague.
<clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank you for holding this important hearing, and Mr. Allison, for coming. The Congress and the American people were misled last fall when former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson told us he needed $700 billion to bail, or excuse me, to buy, uh, to buy troubled assets. Instead, he took the money and used it to partially nationalize the U.S. financial system. As if that weren't bad enough, under both the the Bush and Obama administrations, over $80 million of this money was used to bail out two auto, car, uh, two auto companies, General Motors and Chrysler. President Obama has turned the TARP into little more than a political slush fund, doling out money to special interests under the guise of job creation. This has to stop. Our country cannot sustain much more fiscal irresponsibility. In a year of record deficits, TARP needs to be wound down as soon as possible and the money applied to deficit reduction. Let me repeat. TARP needs to be wound down as soon as possible and the money applied to deficit reduction. TARP has broader implications than just rising deficits, however. The use of public funds by the federal government to get its hooks in the private sector may have far-reaching consequences for freedom and prosperity in the United States. Bailed out companies are merely responding to the whims of well-connected special interests and powerful politicians. These companies have ceased to be private enterprises and become arms of the government and its favorite constituencies. This process threatens to stifle the innovation and competitive spirit that made America the great nation that it is. We, didn't, we need an exit strategy from TARP and we need it now, yet the GAO told us yesterday that the administration's plans for an exit strategy are, quote, evolving. That does not sound encouraging. When you're headed down the wrong road, progress is defined as turning around and getting back to where you need to be just as quickly as possible. I want to thank Mr. Allison again for appearing before the committee today. I'm eager to hear from him about what the administration's plans are to get us out from under this tarp and repay the American taxpayers as quickly as possible. The American people are suffering. Job losses, home foreclosures continue to take a terrible toll on ordinary Americans everywhere. Robust economic recovery depends on restoring a stable economic environment based on a clear separation between government and business with predictable rules of the road. To get there, the federal government needs to stop making up the rules as it goes along and extricate itself from this ill-conceived adventure in crony capitalism. As someone who voted against the TARP, I think I'm on sure footing when I say that this has been a misguided chapter in American government and one that we need to put behind us just as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, I look forward to hearing from our witness. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair will recognize members in the order in which they um, came. Uh, Mr. Cummings is recognized. You may proceed. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, first of all, yesterday, first of all, thank you for holding this hearing. Yesterday's um, hearing yielded a number of differing opinions on how the government should exercise its right as a controlling rights as a controlling shareholder. Unfortunately, none of the witnesses seem to cite the administration's method as the best course of action. President Obama has publicly stated his preference that the government act as a passive investor in AIG, GM, Citigroup, and other firms, voting only on the most fundamental corporate governance issues. Mr. Nader, on the other hand, argued persuasively that when the government has controlling interests in these firms, it has a responsibility to vote its interests actively, leveraging its position into real change at the firm in corporate governance, executive compensation, consumer protections, and corporate social responsibility. The hearing was also valuable in that it reminded us that regardless of whether the government votes its shares actively or passively, that decision must be coordinated with our overall economic policy. Independently but not unrelated, hours before the hearing convened yesterday, it was reported that the Internal Revenue Service had ruled to grant Citigroup's exemptions from tax liability on $38 billion in future profits. By the government selling its 34 percent stake in city, the company stood to lose tax breaks on up to $38 billion in losses. Fortunately, the IRS came to city's rescue, providing a welcome exemption. While questions emerged almost immediately about the fairness of granting city groups such a benefit, what concerned me more about the story was a quote from financial market analyst Christopher Whalen, 
who doubted that Citigroup would emerge from this without having to soon raise capital again. Further, last night it was reported that the market reaction to Citi's equity share offering was less than enthusiastic as shares sold at, substantial, at a substantial discount, and investors expressed concern that Citi was diluting shareholders in a, uh, in a, in a desperate attempt to get out uh, from executive payrolls. The discount led Treasury to announce that it would delay selling its stake in Citigroup. Which leads me to the question that I hope Secretary Allison can address. If the market confidence in Citi is so low that the government refuses to unload its shares at a loss, are we still comfortable that the firm does not present systemic risk and thus should be let out of risk-reducing executive compensation restrictions. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to Assistant Secretary Allison's testimony, and along with the, a continuing discussion on exercising shareholder rights, I hope we can get clarification on the status of the government stake in Citigroup, the rationale for waiving our claims to extensive tax revenue, and whether this firm still presents a risk to the greater economy. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the uh, gentleman. Chair recognizes uh, Ms. Maloney. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thank you for your leadership in this uh, and your attention to detail and your leadership really, truly in so many areas. And uh, thank you, Mr. Allison, for being here today. Uh, uh, the Great Depression uh, was horrific. Uh, my mother and father lived through it. The, the stories they told me were absolutely horrible about the human suffering. And when the historical accounts are written of the Great Recession, the story of what the American people lived through and recovered from will um, have to be told in part uh, with numbers. And the numbers uh, of, uh, of how the distress was felt is much less partly because of the, of the actions of uh, the, this Congress, uh, Treasury, FDIC, and the Federal Reserve. Um, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, uh, voting for it as I did, uh, was probably the most unpopular vote I ever cast, but probably one of the most important. The alternative would have been the failure of our financial markets. Uh, uh, people were calling me. There was a run on the money market funds. There were money run on the banks. And it was not until the Democratic leadership stood up and said they would join the Republican leadership in voting to stabilize our markets that the runs on the banks, the money markets, and other financial instruments uh, uh, held. Uh, Christina Romer, before the Joint Economic Committee, had testified that the economic shocks during the recession were far greater than the Great Depression. So what we lived through was truly a tremendous shock on our markets that could have brought down the American economy. And uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, in fact, uh, although unpopular, uh, the financial system has stabilized. Markets are returning, not to the point we would like, but it has stabilized. And unlike the last month of the Bush administration, where the unemployment numbers were 750,000, last month the unemployment numbers were 11,000. Too much for the families that have lost their jobs, but certainly trending in the right direction. There's been a great deal of uh, criticism of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, and therefore I put in a bill which passed the House of Representatives unanimously with bipartisan support to computerize and track the TARP money so that we know actually where it went, how it was spent, so in the future we can do a better job and also putting sunlight on where we're going and what we're doing. <clears throat> I do want to say on the city group thing, I, I uh, believe that Treasury made the right decision in terms of the American taxpayer not to buy uh, the stock at a distressed amount, but to wait till the stock improves in value so that we get a better return on our money. But my colleague raised uh, some very good points that need to be addressed, and as always, he has a sharp pencil. One of the most important things that passed in our financial recovery is the wound down authority that we put into legislation. After the Great Recession, we had two choices, to let it fail, like Lehman, or to bail it out, like AIG, neither of which is a good choice. When this legislation passes, we will have all financial institutions, the AIGs, 
will be under the FDIC so that we can have an orderly wind down. Uh, we lost over 130 banks with forced mergers, acquisitions, or wind down. We, we controlled it and taxpayers' deposits were secure. Uh, with this new wind down authority, we hope to have a better control over the entire financial markets should we have such a, a tragedy in the future. In any event, this is an ongoing uh, discussion and one that uh, is important to the American people. I applaud the chairman for his attention. Everyone told me that the, the hearing was canceled today, that surely he wouldn't be here because we weren't in session. And I said, no, I know Dennis Kucinich is having his hearing, and I was right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your steadfast work. I thank the gentlelady. Actually, we learned that uh, CQ uh, somehow sent out a notification uh, falsely that this meeting had been canceled. But uh, I didn't check with them. I decided we'd hold the hearing anyway. Um, Chair recognizes Mr. Foster. Yeah, I'd just like to briefly associate my, um, uh, myself with the remarks of, of Congresswoman Maloney. I think she, she hit a number of very important points. Um, one, one point which actually frequently gets misstated um, is the, the question of whether there's been some sort of bait and switch on, on the TARP funds. Um, those of us that actually read the legislation saw there was very clear authority for an emergency investment in large financial institutions that was put in. That was, if, if you go back and read my testimony um, you know, in front of the Financial Services Committee, that was very carefully um, uh, put in there and it was recognized at the time that this would allow what was called at the time, I think, the Swedish style bank rescue. Um, to a direct investment of, of banks under, duress, under distress conditions with a reasonable expectation of getting most of the money out. And because, frankly, um, you know, the Democrats have, have competently managed this operation, I think um, it appears now that the taxpayers are getting out whole from their investments in the banks, which is tremendously um, to your credit. Um, this, is, this requires uh, good management and good oversight and careful attention to detail. Um, we're going to find areas where not everything was done right, but in the big picture, um, getting out whole in our investments in the banks and large financial institutions um, is a tremendous accomplishment. And if, even if we don't quite accomplish it in the case of AIG, um, I think that we have to be careful also to distinguish the, um, the fraction of the money that went into large financial institutions to stabilize the emergency situation there and into the automobile companies where the, the motivation was, I believe, substantially different. There wasn't a systemic risk to the financial world but a, a huge risk um, to, the, um, to the employment and the overall economy. There are different goals there and the expectation of getting out 100 percent whole, I think, um, is going to be different. In that case because the motivations were different. Um, anyway, I, I look forward to diving into the details on this. Um, I'd also like to, to point out the, the, the excellent letter for people that only have time to read summaries on this um, that was that um, Tim Geithner sent to um, Speaker Pelosi and to um, and to Harry Reid um, recently, I guess it's, it's dated December 9th, and I think it has a very good summary of, the, of what you have accomplished, which is non-trivial, and, and the risk going forward, which are also non-trivial. Anyway, um, thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Opening statements. So I'm going to introduce our witness. Uh, Mr. Herbert Allison is Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Stability. Mr. Allison is responsible for developing and coordinating Treasury's policies on legislative and uh, regulator issues affecting financial stability, including overseeing the Troubled Assets Relief Program prior to his public service. Uh, Mr. Allison was uh, CEO of Fannie Mae, and before that he was chairman, president, and CEO of TIAA CREF. Mr. Allison began his career at Merrill Lynch, where he served many roles, ultimately becoming president, chief operating officer, and a member of the board. Uh, Mr. Allison, uh, this subcommittee appreciates 
your appearance here today. We look forward to your testimony and, uh, and also to uh, the opportunity that you're providing us to answer questions about uh, your involvement and the programs that uh, you supervise. So um, you may proceed and you have at least five minutes. If you need a little more, I'm sure we can work that out. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, excuse me, I, I've just uh, been reminded that uh, all witnesses before our uh, subcommittee are uh, asked to be sworn in, so if you could please rise. And uh, raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear uh, the statement you're about to make shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that the witness, uh, that the witness answered in the affirmative. Um, you may proceed. Go ahead. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Or Let's TARP. put that uh, microphone on. Yes, sir. I have the microphone on here. Do you want to check? Bring it closer. We, we want to make sure we can hear you. It's on, I think. We want to can try you hear that. me now? Do you hear me now? Everybody? Okay, go ahead. You may All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. Last fall, to confront a financial system on the verge of collapse, Congress granted the Treasury Department authority to restore liquidity and stability to the U.S. financial system by purchasing and guaranteeing troubled assets. As a result of coordinated efforts, including those taken under the Emergency Economic Stimulus Act, or ESA, confidence in the financial system has improved, credit is flowing, and the economy is growing. The government is exiting from its emergency financial policies, and taxpayers are being repaid. With the announcement this week of repayments by Citigroup and Wells Fargo, banks will soon have repaid nearly two-thirds of the total amount invested in banks under TARP. We expect a positive return from the government's investments in banks. Investments are generating more income than previously anticipated, more than $15 billion so far, and we expect substantial additional income going forward. As banks replace Treasury investments with private capital, confidence in the financial system increases, the government's unprecedented involvement in the private sector diminishes, and taxpayers are made whole. It is clear today that TARP will not cost taxpayers $700 billion. Based on current commitments and plans, we expect total disbursements to be around $550 million billion, with the overall cost of the program at least $200 billion less than the $341 billion projected in the August mid-session review of the President's budget. The financial statements we just published estimate that the ultimate cost of the disbursements through the end of September will be about $42 billion. Treasury does remain an equity shareholder in a few institutions, and I would like to discuss the principles we follow in managing our investments. First, as President Obama has stated, the U.S. government is a shareholder reluctantly and out of necessity. We intend to dispose of our interests as soon as practical, with the dual goals of achieving financial stability and protecting the interests of taxpayers. Second, we do not intend to be involved in the day-to-day -day management of any company. Government involvement in day-to-day -day management might actually reduce the value of these investments, impede the ability of the companies to return fully to being privately owned, and frustrate attainment of our broader economic policy goals. Third, we believe an effective board of directors that selects and oversees capable management with a sound long-term vision should restore a company to profitability and end the need for government support as soon as practical. Fourth, we take a commercial approach to the exercise of our rights as a shareholder. We will vote only on core shareholder matters, such as board membership, amendments to corporate charters and bylaws, mergers, liquidations, substantial asset sales, and significant common stock issuance. 
Because financial conditions have started to improve, Treasury is now in a position to begin winding down TARP programs and to begin exiting from these investments. Our exit strategy for TARP balances the dual mandates of ESA to preserve financial stability and protect the interests of taxpayers. We will exit these investments and return TARP funds to the Treasury as soon as is practical, consistent with the objective of avoiding further market and economic disruption. In my written testimony, I have outlined the specific situations, terms, and exit strategies surrounding our investments in AIG, Citigroup, and the auto companies. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on those topics. As I work with my dedicated colleagues in Treasury, we will continue to manage these investments prudently on behalf of the American people. Thank you for having me here today. I look forward to answering your questions. I, uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're now going to uh, go to questions. Uh, I'll begin with uh, five minutes. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions. If necessary, we'll, uh, if necessary, we'll go to a second round. I'd like to uh, talk about Citigroup. Uh, prior to divesting shares in city, what notification do you plan to give to this committee? Um, we uh, intend to, uh, to be divesting of the shares over the next uh, year. Um, we uh, believe that uh, by uh, gradually selling the shares, we'll be in a better position to uh, achieve uh, the best possible prices for the, uh, for the American public. Um, we are uh, uh, going to be, uh, uh, and we already have stated our approach to divesting of the shares. It'll be a gradual process. Are you going to notify this committee when you're going to do that? Are you going to let us know? We will begin selling the shares after the next 90 days. When you are in the process of selling these shares, are you going to have any communication with the Oversight Committee about this? We'll be happy to uh, speak with the staff of the committee and the members of the committee at any time, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it'd be, it would be, uh, I think, advisable, given the questions that have been raised about uh, the responsibility of the government as a passive shareholder to not be passive with the subcommittee on these matters. What accounts? Um, for what accounts for the timing of your decision to permit then to reverse your decision to allow city to exit from the tarp well let me say first mr chairman thank you for your question uh we don't make the determination of when city can repay the treasury for our investment in the company uh, that decision is made by the regulator and under the provisions of the ARA law, uh, we must follow uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, permission that's given by the, the regulator, regulator. meaning? The regulator meaning the Federal Reserve in this case, and also in consultation so with the So it's the, the Federal FDIC. Reserve that decides when to uh, exit uh, the TARP, and the Federal Reserve uh, does it at, at their choosing, or who, who chooses? How do we know who makes the choice? whether to exit the TARP. How do we know if it's the banks that are deciding or the Federal Reserve? Do you know? The regulators decide, Mr. Chairman, on when it's appropriate for a bank to repay the Treasury. Is that a transparent process, Mr. Allison, or is that pretty much uh, done uh, over at the Fed without any report to you? That's a matter for the, for the regulator. Whether well, they're the regulator, but we're the shareholder. I mean, when, when do we find out? When do you find out? Do you find out when you read about it in the newspaper? When the regulator informs us that uh, it is... Uh, the Fed. When, you know, when the Fed informs you. Yes, sir, in this particular case, or it could be another one but, of the but regulators. But let's talk about the Fed informs yes, you. Yes. The Fed doesn't ask you if you have any position on this. They just tell you they're doing it. Is that what you're saying? We don't exercise regulatory oversight over the banks. That's a matter for the regulatory agencies. But, but, you, but, you, but we, are, we are holding all these billions in shares. So shouldn't the government have, have any ability to decide when the banks uh, would exit from TARP? We're following the, the laws enacted by Congress, Mr. Chairman, as to uh, 
how we will dispose of the shares, and that is with the approval of the regulator. Do you have to agree with the banks whether they're healthy or not, or does the Fed agree with the banks whether they're healthy, but you don't talk to the Fed and you just go along with whatever they tell you? So we you have conversations really with the regulatory agencies, but we do not make the decision as to when a bank is able and ready to repay us. I mean, Mr. Members of the committee, I mean, we've got a problem here where the Fed might let someone out of a tarp, but it might be adverse to the interests of the taxpayers of the United States of America. I just want to point that out. This is, this is a strange system we've set up here. You know, we were not only talking about passive shareholders, but we're talking about shareholders who don't know nothing. Uh, this is a problem. Now, uh, uh, if the chairman will yield for a moment. No. Will city shareholders be given an opportunity to vote on any planned uh, share buyback? Do you know? Under the bylaws of Citigroup, the bylaws would determine uh, the rights of, of the shareholders in that case. Uh, let me also say, if I may, that uh, uh, each of the banks that has repaid us has raised capital in the public markets. They are replacing, when they repay us, government capital with higher quality capital raised in the private markets. And so far, as I mentioned, uh, we have received about two-thirds of the uh, investment back on behalf of shareholders from the banks. They have raised uh, about $150 billion of capital in order to be able to repay us. And we've received about we're, $160 we're gonna, billion. Mr. Allison, we're going to get into that uh, discussion. Uh, my time's expired. I'm going to go to Mr. Jordan in a moment. But we, we're going to get into the discussion about uh, um, how it is that banks are able to raise this money in the um, uh, private markets while they're still under TARP, and how uh, the assets that they're holding have been upwardly evaluated through changes in accounting procedures that enables their stock to go up. They then get more money, pay off the government. I just wonder if we're just in another funny money economy where the taxpayers are going to get hosed again. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think. Chairman's uh, questions point point out to the simple fact: Treasury gets to decide when the money goes in, but not when it comes out. And one of the many problems, I think, underscoring the fact that we should have never gotten into this program, uh, this this whole bailout program to begin with. I think the last two days we've seen two news stories. Uh, the story yesterday that the chairman brought up, I think Mr. Cummings brought up in his opening statement about Citigroup's bailout repayment and, and the impact that has on their on taxes uh, that the uh, company owes. And then today's Wall Street Journal with uh, Treasury Halt's plan to sell off city stock because they, they weren't, they weren't going to get back what they paid for it. I mean, so we got two news stories that just, again, highlight this, in my mind, the fact that we should have never started down this road to begin with because once you do, it just brings on a whole host of problems. Uh, but I want to go to this fact. And, and contrary to Mr. Foster's opening statement, uh, statement where he, I think, tried to rewrite history a little bit, the fact is Congress was misled. In fact, Mr. Allison, in your opening statement, you said that, that TARP was created to purchase troubled assets, direct quote from your opening statement. Um, but that's not what took place. In fact, we had Ms. Baer in front of this committee just last week. She was at the meeting nine days after the TARP was passed, where the nine biggest financial institutions were brought to this, uh, this town. Um, she indicated she, she was in that meeting. And her direct statement when questioning when I asked her was, it took her breath away took her breath away what took place at that meeting where Hank Paulson, Ben Bernanke, Hank Paulson slid a piece of paper over and said, you will take this partial nationalization of your bank. You will take this, uh, this TARP money not to buy, just, just injected capital into the, into the bank. And so we have the history and the record that we got from all the various hearings we've had over the last year, but now we finally have it in writing. Uh, I don't know if you've read Mr. Uh, Wessel's book, in, the, in Fed We Trust, but there's a quote there on page 226, 227 of the book, and I'm reading from the book now. The House of Representatives rejected the Bush administration's bank rescue plan on Monday, September 20th. If you remember last fall, there was the first vote that lost, then a few days later came back to the, to the Congress and the vote that passed the TARP program, lost the vote 228 to 205. The next morning, according to Mr. Wessel's book, Mr. Paulson ran into Michelle Davis, his spokeswoman and policy coordinator in the Treasury building. Quote, I think we're going to have to put equity into the banks, end quote, he said. Despite what Paulson had told Congress, buying toxic assets was going to take too long, Davis gave him a blank stare. 
and said this, we haven't even gotten the bill through Congress. She remembered thinking, quote, how are we going to explain this? She told her boss, we can't say that now. And he took the advice. So we know what happened here. They came to Congress because they couldn't come to Congress and say, hey, give us a bunch of taxpayer money. We're going to go give it to the banks. They had to come up with some scheme to buy troubled assets. And that's what, that's what they sold the whole, the, whole, the whole package to the Congress about. So I just want to ask you, Mr. Allison, do you think the Congress of the United States was misled in this? In, the start of this whole program, do you think Mr. Paulson misled the Congress of the United States uh, last September and last October? Um, I can remember Jordan, first of all, uh, the ESA law allows uh, the Treasury to purchase um, preferred stock and, uh, and other forms of stock from these banks. I think we have to look back at the situation Mr. at the Allison, time. Mr. do you remember back at the time, though? That, that, I mean, you can, you, can, you can say that your opening statement said purchase troubled assets. The whole debate, the whole debate was about purchasing troubled, asset, troubled assets. Uh, last fall, and I think you talk to just about any member of Congress, and they will tell you, maybe with the exception of Mr. Foster, they will tell you that that was the premise of the entire package presented to the Congress of the United States last fall. I know that this has been a question that's been asked many times. However, if we if we look at the ESA law, there clearly was the authority granted to the Treasury to buy troubled assets. Troubled assets are broadly defined. I, it was deemed at that time by the people who were uh, uh, responsible in the Treasury Department and, other, and in the regulators and elsewhere that it would be more efficient use of the authorization in order to stabilize the financial system at the time, which was on the verge of a catastrophic meltdown. The most efficient way of doing that, they felt, was to purchase equity shares. Now, I think we have, to, we have to look at what has been going on. Let me change directions. I yes, sir. A few seconds here, if I could. And, um, Twice in your testimony, you said this should be wound down as soon as practical. Um, with, I mean, twice you said that in your, in your opening statement. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the actions that the House of Representatives took yesterday with the so-called second stimulus using TARP dollars for, quote, job creation, uh, the fact that Mr. Obama has said he supports that, how does that square with what you said twice in your opening testimony about winding this down as quickly as we can? Our responsibilities are to promote financial stability and protect the interests of taxpayers. We are managing the investments that were made under the ESA law with the intention. Mr. Allison, how, yes, how does that square with winding this down as quickly as possible? Your testimony, twice you said that in your, in your opening statement, with the idea that we are now getting completely away from the emission of TARP, whether it was allowing equity or not, we'll, we'll, with the whole job creation stimulus. Uh, stimulus two package yesterday. How does that square with winding it down? Well, those are decisions that will be made by Congress, and our job in managing the TARP to try to wind down this program as quickly as is responsibly possible while also maintaining financial stability. And that's exactly what we're doing, and that's why thirds of the assets that we invested back from the banks, and we've done so at a profit for taxpayers. I, I thank the gentleman. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I um, thank you, Mr. Allison. I, I'm, you know, Mr. Secretary, I've uh, continued to insist that the administration explore all avenues available for preventing uh, further foreclosures in our communities. Um, and not too long ago, Secretary Geithner uh, appeared before the Joint Economic Committee upon mm -hmm. which I sit. And um, we were talking about foreclosure, and this was before the most recent efforts on the part of the President to push the banks to do what they're supposed to do, uh, and that is help people get the modifications quickly. But he said something that I've thought about a lot, and I just want your reaction to it, and I didn't get a chance to ask him to follow up on this. Um, I said to him, a lot of people in my community, uh, in my district, are losing their houses. And it's a very sad sight and a very painful sight. Um, and I said to him, uh, these are people who did not get subprime loans. These are prime. These are people right. who have lost their houses through no fault of their own, in many instances, because they lost their jobs. Um, and I asked him, I said, um, you know, we really do need to do a short-term uh, emergency loan kind of uh, have that kind of effort. And I, I understand that Barney Frank has that in his uh, bill that we just passed. 
But he said something that, that really bothered me. He said, uh, well, Mr. Cummings, there are some people that we just won't be able to help. In other words, he was saying they just got to fall by the wayside. And for some reason, that thing has haunted me because when it came to the banks, we didn't say that. We didn't say they just got to fall by the just got to fall by the wayside. We gave them billions upon billions of dollars, and I'm just wondering. And I, I just wondering, there seems to be sometimes a lack of sensitivity with regard to the person on the street on Main Street, and then and how the bank and, and then when we compare how Wall Street is treated, and I'm telling you that. I am a big supporter of President Obama, probably nobody more loyal. But I got to tell you that in order for him to get his economic uh, efforts to have, be most effective and efficient in his economic efforts to straighten our economy out, you got to have the American people. They got to believe that, that, that there's something coming out of this for them. That's, that's, that's what underlies a lot of the angst that we hear every day. And so I'm just wondering. What do you see with regard to these foreclosures? Because I'm telling you, it's just not the pain. It's also the draining of communities, property values going down, tax revenues going down. I mean, it's just a vicious cycle. And guess what? Those people have to live somewhere. So I'm just wondering, can you comment on that for me? Yes, sir, well, first of all, let me uh, thank you for your, for your uh, comments and your questions. The administration certainly shares your deep concerns about the American public, about people losing their homes. And that's why one of the first acts that the president took when he uh, entered office was to establish the Making Home Affordable program, which we're administering. And that's aimed at keeping people in their homes. And so far, we've expanded that program to help uh, over 700,000 homeowners who are saving on average $550 a month in their mortgage payments. We have shifted also the focus of the TARP program, which initially uh, placed uh, large amounts of money in banks in order to stabilize the financial system, and without that, there'd be far more people unemployed and losing their homes. But in this administration, we've put very little money into banks, only about $7 billion. We've received back $160 billion, and we now focus this program on promoting home ownership, helping small business through small banks in part, and helping the securitization markets, which are responsible for providing a lot of the credit that's available to American households. I'm going to run out of time, but just let me ask you this. With the uh, thought, with, with us owning, say, for example, us having so much equity in some of these banks, I mean, I know, I know the president says take a passive position and all that, but it seems to me that we ought to be able to use more than just a conversation and strong talk to get these folks to, to do the right thing, because I think a lot of us who voted for the bailout and whatever were of the opinion that that people would be able to get the loans and whatever. And I'm just wondering, if people, normal, average people say, well, gee, if we own part of it, we ought to be able to uh, get certain things done. So could you just comment? Yes. I just see my time is yeah. up. Uh, we are meeting with the banks very frequently. We've had them come in uh, four times in the last few months to meet with us to talk about and improve the, uh, the Making Home Affordable program. We're making considerable progress. We're not satisfied by any means. We're not where we need to be. But we are helping uh, more and more people very rapidly today. We still want to be uh, encouraging uh, the banks to work even harder and more effectively. We're meeting with housing counselors. We're holding events all over the country to bring in homeowners, to acquaint them with this program. Uh, we've, made, we've streamlined the program a great deal, so it's easier for people to provide the documentation, to get a permanent modification. And there's still more that we can be doing. We're looking at uh, how we can help more unemployed, for example. Currently, the program provides that if a person is unemployed and they're going to be receiving at least nine months of unemployment insurance, they're eligible for a modification. We're seeing whether we can enhance that program further. But let me also say that the Obama administration is not relying only on the ESA programs under TARP to help homeowners. The Economic Stimulus Act and all of the many activities of HUD and, and others in the administration are working very hard through housing agencies and, and state and local governments to help people keep their homes. 
Chair, recognize Mr. Turner, Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your continued efforts to work on this issue and to, to bring to light some of the, um, the disparities that, that I think happen in the application of, the, uh, of these funds. Uh, I voted against the TARP program, and I voted against the applying the TARP monies to General Motors, and I did that because I believed that the, uh, the legislation itself was, um, was undefined as to its goals and objectives, undefined as to how it was going to be accomplished, that it could result in inequities. Um, I come from Ohio, like the Chairman and Ranking Member Jordan, and so I'm from ground zero of the mortgage foreclosure crisis, right. and I didn't see in the TARP anything that was going to result in targeting the real problem that resulted in the financial crisis. I believed it was going to reward those who were the bad actors and, in fact, leave the American people, those who um, were there either in neighborhoods where foreclosure was rampant or those themselves that were foreclosed without having any significant help. Um, having said that, though, I do want to thank you for your dedication. I'm certain that as you approach these issues, you, you have um, you know, in your heart an absolute dedication to moving this country forward and to uh, ensuring our financial st stability. And uh, I appreciate you coming forward so we can ask questions of some of those issues that either need to be addressed mm -hmm. or you know, are, are information for us so that we know that we shouldn't do it this way again. Mm -hmm. uh, my two areas of concern relate to um, uh, the General Motors uh, bailout. And in your testimony, uh, you, one of your paragraphs, you end that paragraph by saying, the new companies are now leaner and more efficient and poised to help further the ongoing economic recovery and the competitiveness of the American automotive industry. Well, the problem with that leaner and more efficient is it translates directly to the issue of, of jobs, um, commitments to retirees, uh, commitments to employees. And that's an area where I have significant concern because in my community, General Motors closed its plants, Delphi closed its plants, Delphi walked away from its pension obligations to the salaried workers. 21,000 salaried workers were treated differently than their coworkers that they worked side by side with, having uh, losses of substantial portions of their pensions that not only did they depend on for their future, um, but they earned. Um, and this is being done in the name of a leaner and more efficient company as they're pushed aside and, and creditors, um, some of which are being honored uh, instead of the honoring of the employees who made the company successful in the past. The company's failing of no, no fault of their own uh, as they showed up every day and were dedicated to the success of Delphi and, and to General Motors. So my two questions are, <clears throat> could you please speak for a moment about the Delphi pension issue and the disparate treatment that uh, workers received? Um, I think it's inherently unfair and I, I um, I believe that, that this should have been handled differently. And there were great opportunities as the administration was at the table in the negotiations of the bankruptcy deals and the, the, the terms um, where, where people could have been honored instead of cast aside in the name of more leaner and more efficient. The second thing is, is the, this issue of, of jobs going offshore. Um, we, um, I personally believe that when this is all said and done, that will not only be less jobs in the United States in the in the um, vein of having them leaner and more efficient, but there will be more jobs overseas with General Motors for their suppliers, their direct investment, and their partnerships. And I would have thought that would have been a goal of the administration to ensure that the jobs were made here in America, that we don't take taxpayers' money and finance, in effect, jobs going offshore so that it weakens our economy in the future. The, the suppliers that would have supplied those jobs, the individuals that would have, have held those jobs lose that opportunity. Um, so I'm very concerned on those two areas. One, the, the loss of the pensions to people that were in Delphi, and two, the loss of jobs off seas, uh, overseas. Could you speak to that? Um, thank you very much, Congressman, for the question. Uh, the administration is very concerned about job loss, obviously, and has been extremely active in trying to uh, reduce the uh, unemployment rate and also to, uh, to uh, begin to rebuild this economy in ways that can create far more jobs for the American public. Uh, if we look back on the, uh, on the actions taken to rescue General Motors and Chrysler, without those actions, hundreds of thousands of more jobs would have been lost, not just in those companies, but in the suppliers and the dealers in the large network that is the auto industry in the United States. So we would have had a far worse uh, crisis. 
Uh, our role in TARP is to promote financial stability, and by uh, intervening with those two companies, we were able to do just that. They were all, not just manufacturing companies, but large uh, financing and lending companies. Um, our role, though, is not to manage those companies directly. We did uh, review their plans. We insisted that their plans be altered to, uh, to assure us that they would be able to sustain and eventually grow their business. So this is about enabling these companies to survive and then enabling the auto industry and those companies to grow in the future. Uh, we did uh, uh, take steps to assure that they would have a, a new board as well as new management. They have been making progress. Uh, and uh, so we are hopeful that down the road uh, they will be growth engines again, Thank along with the auto moment. industry. Mr. Chairman, if I could clarify, I just want to make certain that we have the, the uh, general the understanding. Will suspend. Hold, hold on. Sure, if I, 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 I just I, I'm going to let the gentleman follow up, but but. There's a point raised here that I, I'm going to have to take a privilege as chair and interject. You know, if the Treasury isn't managing day-to-day -day operations, then why did uh, a high-ranking administration official brag about the fact that you're actually um, paying workers less? I don't understand. I mean, I, I, could you answer the, his question and follow up what's going on here uh, first of all uh, I don't I don't I don't think anybody is commenting in the administration about the wage levels of, of people here what we're talking about is enabling these companies to operate and eventually to grow again sir and, sir, and, and to preserve the jobs go ahead, chairman, yes, sir. Go ahead Please. follow up chairman's assistance um, I, I just want to make certain that I'm not misspeaking you, you would agree that taxpayers' funds that are financing General Motors and its reorganization are being used for the financing of jobs moving offshore. I mean, it's inevitable. No. There, 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 is, there is no way to sequester the, the funds as the taxpayers' money is being used as capital for General Motors, and General Motors in turn uses capital for taking jobs offshore. It is inevitable that uh, that, that capital um, is, is in part taxpayers' funds. Would you not agree with that? Well, let me say, first of all, that there were standards established for both companies to I, maintain, sir, it, 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 to it, it, maintain a certain it, percentage. My, my, my time uh, is as a general up. suspend, uh, you know, I, I've actually given you eight minutes because I thought this exchange was ex very important, but we're going to have another round. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Foster right now. We'll come back to you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Allison, just put a little bookmark by this discussion because we will get Fine. back to it. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Foster. You're recognized. Um, yeah, I'd like to go over quickly just a few different um, take your time, aspects. Um, one of them is the, the Money Market Fund Guarantee Program, which is one of um, Treasury's activities um, relating to ESA. Um, what was the maximum size of this program in terms of assets um, guaranteed? The maximum size of the ESA program? Um, no, the Money Market Guarantee Fund. You know, I believe that at one point we were guaranteeing about uh, three trillion dollars. Okay, and what are the losses that have been incurred at this program? Actually, we earned a profit on that program of over a billion dollars. Okay, and is there any way to estimate if the money markets, um, you know, were not bailed out, if, if my colleagues from Ohio had had their way, um, and the money markets had collapsed, is there any way to estimate the loss to the economy um, from the collapse of the money markets? Have they not been bailed out? Uh, if the um, if the money market funds were allowed to begin failing, there would have been, a, in effect, a giant run on the bank, both on the money market funds, which are a source of many Americans' savings, as well as on the banking system as a, as a whole. I don't think we can exaggerate the level of, uh, of, uh, of that crisis last year. It was, as was earlier stated, unprecedented as, in terms of and, and it being a financial crisis. And if we hadn't taken very strong action at the time, the the consequences of that would have been cataclysmic. Right, and, and as you said, the, um, the taxpayer actually turned a small profit on that interaction. Yes. Um, thank you. Now, in the case of Citi, um, 
if, if you follow through your strategy going forward, um, that, that you're going to dribble the stock into the market over time, and if it, it's trading at roughly its, its current value, and as I understand, there's a warrant position that the yes. government also yes, has. Is. Is there, what is your, your best estimate as of today, if you just execute that, there are no big shifts in the market price, that, that what you'll end up with? Are we going to be money ahead or money behind in the investment in city? I really, at this point, wouldn't want to forecast uh, uh, our profitability on the Citigroup position. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would tell you is currently uh, we would have a, a small profit on that position overall, uh, counting their, uh, their payments of dividends to us over time, but I wouldn't make a forecast right. down the road. But what I would point out, however, prices, would I would point out that so far we have earned a profit on our investments in the uh, financial institutions, um, okay. in, the, in, the, uh, in the banks, that is. And, and could you say a little bit about the, the difference in the decision mechanism for exiting TARP between um, you know, a, a primarily privately held bank or publicly held bank in which the government has a minority position and something like Citi or AIG where you know, we, we own most of it? You know, what, what is the difference, if any, in the decision mechanism for deciding how to exit TARP? Well, again, the decisions are made uh, as to when a bank is ready to exit by the regulator. And let me point out is, that... Is in, but is there a separate... Do, does the bank also have to request to exit, or, or does the regulator boot them out? Or does there have to be a separate choice to, that I want to exit now? There's a discussion between the bank and the, and the regulators. I think in many cases the banks have been eager to, to exit the TARP, and, uh, but they can't exit unless the regulators uh, opines that they're able to. And in these cases where the banks are exiting, I should point out that their capital ratios are far better than they were before this crisis began. And uh, they've been building uh, a tangible common equity positions, which are far larger than they were. And so they're in a much better financial condition than before this crisis and certainly during this crisis. So at the same time as we're being repaid, these banks are exiting in a far better position than they were. Okay, and, and there's an ongoing um, stress test. Is a final stress test applied um, prior to the exiting or, or an ongoing um, stress test rigor applied yeah. to these firms? The regulators are constantly examining the condition of these banks closely monitoring them closely, and then they render their opinion as to whether the bank is ready to repay. Okay. Thank you. Yield me. Thank the gentleman. We're going to go to a second round of questions here, so given the uh, member interest in your appearance, mm -hmm. Mr. Allison. Uh, isn't it true that the statute requires that you maximize taxpayer value? Yes, sir. And if you're maximizing um, the value, how do you do that by divesting rapidly and awarding special tax benefits that reduce tax revenues? Well, let me talk about the, um, the recent guidance that was issued uh, by the IRS regarding Section 382, which you commented on earlier. Uh, I think that uh, this the purpose of that uh, section has been mischaracterized in the press. It was intended, it, it was enacted actually back in the 1980s, to prevent uh, corporate raiders from sheltering income in one company by buying a company that had tax loss carry forwards and using those carry forwards to shelter themselves from tax. It was in taxpayers' interests as a whole that that rule was but, enacted. But, you, know, that, you know, thanks for the history lesson, but, you know, that's... Let's right. go more to and, and therefore, day. therefore, <laughs> when the government uh, purchased shares in some of these companies, right. that was an extraordinary event not contemplated by Section 382. So all that has been done is that there's a very narrow uh, guidance relating only to purchases and then sales recently uh, by well, the government well, but, but you, you so still that... With all due respect, Mr. Allison, you still didn't answer my question. And uh, I understand that you're not going to answer the question. So we're, what we'll do is we'll have more of a written series of uh, interrogatories between the subcommittee and you so you can uh, walk us through how, under this narrow passage of, of 382, you uh, ended up uh, with a circumstance where the government gave huge tax 
breaks, multi-billion dollar tax breaks to a company that's uh, in a bailout. That, that to me, is a bailout on top of a bailout. And I'm, we're going to keep that going. I don't want to spend all my time talking about that, but I just want you to know that we're going to keep asking questions about that. Um, can, can you explain how Treasury avoided a conflict of interest in both managing shares in city and, and awarding a tax exemption for the one-time sale of the government stock in the company? How, how did that? Well, let, let me first of all say that rule uh, that Section 382 still applies to Citigroup and as it was intended to. We have not changed that in any way. But is there a conflict? I mean, are you, I, I, how, how, tell me how you do this. I, I'm going to do it the way Mr. Cummings would do it. Tell me how you do this. How do you, on one hand, say that you represent the taxpayers in maximizing their value and on the other hand, get more money from the shareholders by giving more of the taxpayers' money to the shareholders. Help me with that. Please. I'm having difficulty no. understanding that. Well, first of all, the United States government is not a taxpayer. Uh, the United States government is not a taxpayer. This, the, well, whose money are, the, whose the, money are the, you the dealing with here? I, I'm, I just I missed something. Yeah. What was created when the government invested, and at the time it invested, it issued guidance as well about its investments in these companies. The government is not a, ta is not a taxpayer. Uh, but it the, works with the, taxpayers' and, and, money. And, and the intention of, of getting in was this was very extraordinary. It was intended to be a short-term investment. It was not for the purpose of, of sheltering taxable income. Does the right hand know what the left hand's doing, Mr. Allison? Uh, On one hand, the, the, the right hand's uh, uh, handling shareholder assets. The left hand's handling taxpayers' money. We're, we'll go into this more. I got one more question, and you know, I, I'm, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to cut you off, but my time's running short here. As major sh shareholders in four companies, will shareholder votes um, coming this spring, uh, in, with shareholder votes coming this spring, will Treasury be voting these shares? Treasury will be voting shares along the lines that I outlined in my testimony. Uh, we'll be voting uh, uh, on the uh, election of directors. Uh, we will be uh, voting over time on uh, special corporate events, major corporate events. And what, uh, what's the process by which you'll take positions on issues before the shareholders? Uh, at, we are uh, working on those, uh, uh, on those guidelines now. And uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to talk with the committee members about that. That would be them. great. We'd, we'll be happy to do so. That. So, you, so you'll, we'll have some dialogue between Treasury and uh, the committee before you get to a situation before you're actually right. voting on those shares. Thank you. That's, that's progress. Appreciate that. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Allison, in your discussion with Mr. Foster a few minutes ago, you talked about this program and made it sound like it was apple pie, wonderful. I think the word profit was used several times in that discussion. But so I'm just curious, uh, what do we expect, what do the taxpayers expect when it comes to the TARP dollars, their dollars that were put into AIG, GM, Chrysler, the financing arm of GM, the financing arm of Chrysler, what do we expect to happen there? Are we going to be able to use the word profit when we're talking about all that money, those billions of dollars put in those five entities? Uh, well, just last week we published our valuations of all of our assets, and uh, we'll be sending you a copy of this if you haven't already received it. And it is a full report on our approach to valuation and the current values of these positions. And the way that we value them is where possible to use market instruments uh, cut to, to the, cut uh, to the chase. Are we yes, going to be able to use the word profit like you did uh, so many times in, in talking about the banks? Well, uh, it's I'd say too early to uh, to be able to estimate hasn't, what hasn't, the outcomes will be. Currently, hasn't the, hasn't the currently, himself uh, said that uh, we are uh, not likely to make a profit on AIG, yeah. GM, and Chrysler. Right. Currently, uh, we show that uh, the total uh, current valuation of uh, the auto companies and AIG 
would be uh, a loss of about $60 billion, which is less than it was before. Again, let me emphasize that the projected losses using the, uh, the accepted means of valuation were about $341 billion. They're, they're $200 billion less than that over the entire program. The investments in total point that have been made point, so far would show being, a look. Yes, sir. The picture is not quite as rosy when we talk about all the money that's been put into those entities. Yes, sir. That, that, that's true. Today, they are marked as, uh, as, people, as losses. Rational people, including the Secretary of, of Treasury himself, would say it's likely the American taxpayer is going to lose on those five. Uh, based on current valuations. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, and, and this, this I think brings up a point. I, I think it's important, you know, think about this. This committee has had over the last year, oh, I forget how many hearings on Bank of America. We've had Mr. Borofsky in front of this committee a couple times, I believe. We've had Mr. Kashkari, Mr. Allison today, and we appreciate that. We've had Mr. Feinberg, and I do want to ask the gentleman a question about Mr. Feinberg. We had a hearing in Cleveland, Ohio, in, in, at, the, at the chairman's request on the HAMP program. Uh, miserable failure, we found out at that, that hearing, a home, um, a home mortgage modification program not working. Uh, at some point, I think it makes sense. Treasury Secretary seems to be able to come and testify in front of the Budget Committee, in front of other committees. It makes sense for him to come in front of the Oversight Committee, whether it's this subcommittee on domestic policy, Mr. Chairman, or frankly the full committee. Uh, that seems to be in order, and frankly it uh, should have happened sooner rather than, uh, rather than later. And I got, I got another question, Mr. Chairman, well, I, but I guess I, I was directing that question to the chairman well, a little bit. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to the gentleman's question. I, I, think, uh, I think the gentleman raised a valid point about the responsibilities that we have as a subcommittee for oversight on this matter. And uh, let's uh, consult and uh, draft a letter of invitation. Thank I, you. I appreciate the chairman's willingness to do that. Let me just ask you one last question, Mr. Allison. We did have Mr. Feinberg here. What kind of interaction do you have with the uh, uh, the executive compensation czar, so-called PAYZAR? Uh, I speak with the PAYZAR uh, from time to time. That is Mr. Feinberg, who is the special master overseeing compensation of companies that have received uh, speak, exceptional assistance. Speak, from, speak with him from time to time. Do you review his decisions at all? Do you weigh in on his decisions when it comes to compensation for executives? Mr. Feinberg's decisions are his own. He's, he's, he's independent does, for those purposes. Does, um, does Mr. Feinberg answer to anybody? Mr. Feinberg uh, uh, is uh, responsible to the Secretary of the Treasury for performing his role, but Mr. Feinberg has been making his decisions are you, independently. Are you troubled by the fact, I mean, you're, you're an accomplished individual, served our country in the Navy, you got an undergraduate degree from Yale, master's degree from Stanford. Uh, held many important roles in private sector and now the public sector. Are you troubled by the fact that we have one single individual in the United States government telling private American citizens how much money they can make? First of all, uh, Mr. Feinberg is, has made his decisions transparent. The American people can judge for themselves. That's not what uh, I asked. I ask, are you troubled that someone with your education, your experience, your background, and frankly someone whose title is uh, Secretary for Financial Stability overseeing the TARP program, are you troubled by the fact we have in the United States of America one single individual telling private American citizens how much money they can make? Uh, gentlemen's time's expired, but you may answer, and I would encourage you to answer the question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have to, again, put this in the context. The, we, we made investments on behalf of the taxpayers, extraordinary investments, unprecedented, in financial institutions. These are temporary investments. We have to protect the taxpayers' interests. And therefore, yes or uh, no. there was you, and compensation. Yes compens or no. It's a yes or no. And I will tell you, Mr. Feinberg said the, the, yes, he the, is troubled the, by the very that. Well, he the, himself said that. I want to ask yeah. him the same question. I would okay. say that it's, it's unfortunate that we're at the point because of this crisis where uh, a special master has to be appointed to protect the interests of taxpayers. I think that he has a very difficult job. I think he's performing it well. Thank, thank so you. So I'm not to, troubled by his performance at all. Thank the gentleman. Well, we're going to go to Mr. Cummings. You're recognized for five minutes. Go thank ahead. you very much. On March 30th, President Obama uh, publicly rejected both the GM and the Chrysler plans for stabilization and long-term viability. The White House hired dozens of uh, consultants, a dozen consultants and experts and 
and force additional reviews and major changes to their plans and then approve them. Why wasn't that same in-depth, hands-on approach used when it came to the financial firms? Well, we have to again take account of the situation at the time that those initial investments were made. This country faced a financial catastrophe and it literally had days to act before uh, the, the entire system would unwind uh, irreparably perhaps. And therefore, those decisions were made, I think, by very capable people under tremendous pressure. And I think that the uh, events since then have proven the wisdom of those actions that were taken at the time. I think they saved the financial system and the American economy and the taxpayers receiving returns uh, that I think were far better than anyone could have dared forecast at the time. Yeah, well, and so do you think the trusteeship model that was used for AIG should have been considered for use with all companies in which the government held voting shares? Well, again, the uh, trustee uh, structure f overseeing AIG was, uh, was formed before the ESA law right. was enacted. Right? And uh, uh, I think uh, today uh, we have, with the other companies, uh, uh, Treasury is overseeing our investments. I think it's important to link the authority over financial stability with the oversight of our investments in those companies so that authority and accountability are conjoined. Mm -hmm. And so now we are in a situation where you just said that with regard to our voting shares, you, you, you sound like you, there's some meetings that take place and then you decide on what you're going to vote on. Is that right? Or you decide how it's going to be voted on uh, and does, do you and Mr. Geithner and others in the administration have any kind of say on what happens with our votes? I mean, and how is that decided? Yeah. Uh, I, what we'll do is to uh, provide you with the information on how we intend to vote our shares. That is, the procedures that we'll be taking to make those decisions. And when, when will we have that? Uh, in, in the first quarter. Okay. Listen, uh, I was just reading a New York Times article this morning. It says four big mortgage backers swim in ocean of debt. And it's referring to AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and GMAC. And this is a very interesting statement. I just want to hear your reaction to this. Uh, it says they appear, talk about those four companies, they appear at risk of getting onto a debt merry-go-round where they have to draw new money from the government just to keep up with their existing government debts. Fannie Mae recently warned, for example, that it could not pay the dividends it owes the Treasury, uh, so future dividend payments will be effectively funded with equity drawn from the Treasury. Now, I'm going back to uh, some questions on the part of the Chairman. The Chairman asked a little earlier. It, you know, I'm just, it just seems like we almost have a shell game going on here. In other words, we take from uh, the feds and then we, we take from one pot. It's sort of like having a line of credit. And so you take from your line of credit to pay your mortgage, um, but you're never really getting out of debt. I mean, is that, is that, a, uh, is that a, an appropriate analogy? Well, uh, first of all, the, uh, the uh, GSEs uh, are not uh, under TARP. Right, I understand. And that. Uh, with with respect to AIG, but you deal with these folks, right? Uh, I mean, I, see, we, I have to get you when I got you. Yeah. You're here. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. see you again. Uh, I don't have responsibility over the the GSE's funding. Okay. But let me say, with regard to AIG, which is within TARP, we don't anticipate making any further investments in AIG. And why is that? Because uh, we, we believe that uh, uh, the investments we made uh, should be adequate. And uh, we are monitoring that company carefully, and it's making progress against its plans, for example. Does that mean we're going to get our money back? Uh, again, uh, at currently, we would show uh, in our valuations a loss on that investment. That is not a prediction of the outcome. And I wouldn't want to make a prediction at this point. I think it's too soon. AIG is still in the midst of transformations that are intended to maximize value. The chairman of AIG has stated that he expects 
to pay back the U.S. government every dollar. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Right, thank you. I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you. you may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Allison. I want to get back to General Motors, but before I do, I just want to touch briefly on this issue of whether the taxpayers are going to make a profit out of these bailouts or, or not. And I want to uh, recognize that to this point you have been hesitant to speculate on the final outcome, which I certainly understand and respect. I understand that you're basically saying to us um, you know, the, the final um, debits and credits have not been made, so I'm, I'm not going to predict what um, the outcome would be of losses and gains. And, and I think it's probably best that you're unwilling to do that as you're trying to look to manage these assets. And wanting these assets to have value, you don't want to predict their, right. their non-value. So I, I respect that. But I do want to say, and, and I, I want to ask you to correct me if I'm wrong, um, which would not violate your lack of speculation, yeah. that, um, um, that, that to speak of profits is immature, I, excuse me, premature. I personally believe that to speak of profits is misleading. Um, because what we're really talking about is transactions from which there is revenue that will be offset by, I believe, massive losses in, in other areas. And that when we talk in the aggregate, in the aggregate, I believe that there are going to be losses but no one currently is predicting profit. So would, would you disagree that no one is currently predicting that in the aggregate of our bailouts, AIG, General Motors, uh, TARP, uh, that there's going to be a profit? No one is currently predicting in the yes. aggregate from these bailouts that there's yeah. going to be a profit. You agree? Well, sir, I've learned after 40 years in the financial business not to make predictions about markets or investment outcomes. However, but, but you know, but however, you're, you're, but no one is yes, predicting. Sir. Well, uh, and I think uh, under the circumstances, if you look at our valuations, we are also currently valuing some of those investments at a loss. It's less of a loss in, in a number of these cases than it was even six months ago. Okay. Well, I, I don't can, know I, the final outcome, but point. currently we are showing losses in some of those investments. Yes, sir. And I appreciate you saying that because mm -hmm. I think when members or, uh, of Congress or members of the administration step forward and give selected pieces of information to give the public the perception that there are actually profits that are being generated, they're ignoring, and you have not done that. Let uh, me make it Thank clear, you. Mr. Allison, Thank you have you. not done that, that they are misleading the public on what the likely outcome will be. So I just wanted well, to I, I would invite uh, the members of the committee as well as the public to take a look at our valuations, again, published last week as of the third quarter of this year. And uh, they will get full information about our valuations of these investments by category. And uh, again, I, w I would say that uh, we are working very hard to preserve value for the taxpayer. And so far, because you know, yes, we've got to get to General Motors before my time is yes, up again. Please, go ahead. Um, where I was last time was the taxpayers have provided capital to General Motors. Yes. General Motors has used capital for the purposes of moving jobs offshore through. Um, partnerships, direct investment, and um, uh, you know, outsourcing. Um, isn't it true that if the taxpayers are giving General Motors capital and General Motors using capital to move jobs offshore, offshore the taxpayers' funds are being used to move jobs offshore? Um, Congressman, I, I don't believe that that is a correct characterization of the use of our assets. These, these, now, these now, investments... Let's, let's, let me back up then. Please cause, do. Cause is not capital fungible? I mean, if General Motors had, had um, you know, was starved for capital and they weren't able to undertake capital projects and you gave them money for capital and then they used capital money to move jobs offshore, you are enabling them, you are making it possible for them, you are providing capital that inherently is being used as capital to fund their program that results in jobs moving offshore. How, how can that not be the case? I think the most accurate characterization of our investment is that it saved hundreds of thousands of American jobs. Now, again, let so me Mr. emphasize. Johnson, you would deny that, that the taxpayers' monies um, assisted General Motors in moving jobs offshore? I, I think that far more jobs would have been lost here That's in America had we would not Would you do deny it? that General Motors moved jobs offshore, that the taxpayers assisted General Motors in moving jobs offshore? You're denying that? I think the taxpayers assisted General Motors in surviving and creating more American jobs down the road. And I think that was vital to the, not just the industry of the United States, but the, to the financial system as well. I think that... Uh, well, Mr. That Allison, you've been very careful in your statements and in your credibility in this hearing, and I really wish that, that you would not diminish your credibility by trying to deny this aspect, which is a basic accounting one in which everyone knows is true. 
The taxpayers provided capital to General Motors. General Motors is using capital to move jobs offshore. The taxpayers' capital is facilitating moving jobs offshore. I would appreciate it if, for your credibility, you could acknowledge that. I, I do not agree, respectfully, sir, that they're using their capital to move jobs offshore. Let me also say, because I think what they're doing is, and what, what we have done, is to save hundreds of thousands of American jobs by stepping in with Chrysler and General Motors. I, let me also emphasize that the U.S. government is not in the business of running companies. We are owning those shares not by our desire, but by necessity. We'd like to shed ourselves of those investments as rapidly as we responsibly can, and that's precisely what we're about doing. And, but we are not going to run these companies, and I think that would be of great concern to many in the American public if we were to take over the companies and start making management decisions. And I don't I, think we'd I, make the best management I, you know, decisions. Your time's expired, but Thank I just want to say, you know, again, because you know, I, I have these same concerns, You can't, on one hand, say that you really don't want to be managing these companies and let a lot of American jobs be at stake and watch companies that are holding bailout funds move jobs out of the country and just say, oh, you know, we're just sorry. Yeah. We don't really have anything to do with that. Pass the biscuits, please. No, 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 no. That's not the way we look at it. And I think it would be important for you, Mr. Allison to take back to the Treasury Secretary the feelings of members of this committee about how people use these funds. And if jobs are, in fact, going to Korea and other countries, uh, jobs are going, and they're going with the help of companies that we've given a lot of money, I think that's a legitimate concern, and I just want to support the gentleman's line of inquiry. Chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Mr. Foster. Thank you. Um, let's see. At the point that the EESA um, authorization passed, um, do, do you recall what the estimate for the fraction by the Congressional Budget Office of the fraction of the money that would not be recovered? Um, you know, what was what fraction was expected to be lost when it got scored? Uh, of the total program at the beginning program early this year, uh, the estimate was that the total loss would be over 340 billion dollars in the TARP program. Okay. And, and so is that fairly excluded at this point, unless there's something dramatic happens, that, that that's going to be, end up being a gross overestimate of the, uh, the As I mentioned before, that estimate has been reduced about, by over $200 billion so far. Okay. I'd, I'd like to return, if I could, for a moment to this historical question of whether or not members of Congress understood what was actually in the, the ESA authorization. And I'd like to quote, if I could, from my testimony to the Financial Services Committee on September 28th of 2008. This is the day before the first of the two House votes on the ESA authorization. So this is what I said at the committee at the time. Um, this is not the time for ideological fighting about class warfare from the left or blind adherence to the principles of the unfettered free markets and zero government regulation from the right. This is the time for serious people from both parties to work fast, work smart, and map a way out of this crisis. And the second point that I would like to make is that there are two routes mapped out of this crisis by the legislation we are considering, the auction route and the equity route. I wish to express my tr strong preference for the equity route, and I believe that the American taxpayer and business owner will agree. In the auction route, taxpayer funds are used to buy off toxic assets left over from bad loans at a pearl above anything you can get in the current market. Financial firms are bailed out, and life goes on pretty much um, as usual for these firms, with the exception that they've learned that whenever they make a whole batch of bad loans, they can expect to be bailed out by the U.S. taxpayer. In the equity route, also allowed by this proposed legislation, the firms are bailed out, but at the price of government getting a big share of the company. I believe this is a far better deal for the taxpayer. The companies will be required to write down the value of their toxic assets, essentially admitting that their worthless paper is worthless, and in exchange, the government injects cash by buying a large fraction of these banks. This is not due to the recent AIG bailout. Over time, the market recovers and the banks are sold back to private investors. Um, and money goes on and describing the advantages of this. So that the statement that Congress did not understand what was authorized by the ESA thing must come from people that either didn't read it or didn't understand what was there. It was very clearly understood that there were two ways out of this, and at least on my part, very clearly understood that one of these was preferable because it's all that could happen in the emergency situation we're in. Um, and I believe that um, 
that those of us um, that in fact voted in favor of the ESA authorization were the adults in the room and have made a, a, a vote that we can be proud of forever. Anyway, um, that's I guess what I have to say there and I yield back. Yeah, I, I want to uh, thank the gentleman, uh, and, and I have a comment to make. I don't want to make it when you're out of the room. You should be in the room because I'm going to respond to what you said. Uh, the, the Treasury Secretary, um, Mr. Paulson, um, made a statement that the money was not going to use to deal with the foreclosure crisis. He said that. Now, now, why would he do that unless there was some kind of a misimpression? Or not a misimpression, an impression that we were given. We had a hearing on this, Mr. Allison and Mr. Foster. We had a hearing on this. Now, I, I just, I just want to um, point out uh, something that, I, 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 that really does trouble me about what's happening with uh, the, way, the way the wealth of the nation is just being accelerated upward. And, and that's one of the problems I've had with, with the bailout. You may say, well, it, it helps stabilize the American economy. But what, what I see is, is a separation between the real economy and, and Wall Street. That Wall Street uh, is stabilizing the markets, uh, you know, a lot better. The um, banks are doing well. They parked their money at the Fed for a while so they could get higher interest rates. But they're not, you know, all across this country, people are starved for capital. You have small businesses failing. You have shopping centers who's, who, that are becoming vacant because people can't afford the rents anymore because the people owning the centers or developers are getting cash calls or credits are uh, evaporating. Uh, we're still, you know, we're, we're in a deep recession uh, that, that has not yet bottomed out despite the statistical correction to the November statistics. This separation between the finance economy and the real economy is real. This is not some fake idea. So you can't call that class warfare. That's a fact. And you know, there is no, the class warfare is over. We lost. I want to make that announcement here today. Working people lost. The middle class lost. Don't tell me about class warfare. Come to my neighborhoods in Cleveland. I'll show you class warfare. I'll show you hollowed out areas. I'll show you businesses that went down because they don't have access to capital. And on Wall Street, it's fat city. Don't tell me about class warfare. Thank you for being here, Mr. Allison. I look forward to uh, having an opportunity to hear more uh, testimony from Treasury and uh, look forward to having this subcommittee working with you. This is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. It's been a hearing on the government as dominant shareholder. How should taxpayers' ownership rights be exercised? Appreciate your presence. Have a good holiday. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sure.